seek discomfort after Anis Majgani's shake the dust. I am choosing between love and fear every day. I tried to write a eulogy to the coward in me, but he is not dead yet. Courage isn't making a ghost of all my frightened parts, revolting against my tender underbelly, rioting beneath my tongue. They have protected me like a lifeline. But I have been filling my gut with light, or love, or joy, or staying up to pass my bedtime, laughing into the night, or other heroics that are synonymous with God. I am always afraid, but jump anyway, shake the dust when I land, turn my survival into a love song for you who looks into the mirror and cannot find yourself. You have made sadness your home, free falling and you can't get up, shake the dust. Do not obey the gravity of your fears, seek discomfort and love. Regardless. Hi, I'm Abi Sovini, based in the city of Tswane, South Africa, and welcome to Pace Entangled. Yes, welcome everybody. Uh, it's so great to uh, have you all with us again. Good afternoon, Africa, Europe. Uh, good evening, Australia, Asia, and good morning uh, here from New York uh, and America. Um, thank you, Clabiso Vili. Unfortunately, I can't do the click sound, but that was a beautiful opening uh, for day two. We had a wonderful uh, first day yesterday. Uh, it was really very engaging and, uh, and, and so excited to see all the enthusiasm from everybody. Uh, my name is Erwin Maas. Uh, I am, like I said, based in New York. I'm one of the co-founders together with my crimes and partners, uh, Nikkei Jonah and Ricardo Peach, uh, one of the co-founders of PACE. Uh, and we welcome you all here today for our second day uh, of PACE Entangled. I just have a few housekeeping notes uh, and then I'm going to give you over to the first panel uh, of today. Um, so to get the best experience of Pace Entangled, uh, there are a few different platforms. We are meeting three times each day uh, on a platform such as this in Zoom uh, or AirMeet. Uh, but there's also engagement through the website. Please, if you haven't registered, please register. And if you have registered, please check out the website because a lot of the artists' works are on the website. Videos for tour ready, videos and works for work in progress. Uh, and then we also have the WhatsApp group. Uh, so I know it's very active and that might scare some people off, but we do ask you to uh, be part of that WhatsApp group, for, at least for this week, because artists will also engage via the WhatsApp group. So those are the three ways to engage. I want to thank our entire team, Mark Dobson, Isabel Luck, Sumari, Lizanda, Tutakani, uh, everybody that has worked so hard in these last two months to, make, to really quickly make this happen online as we could not meet in South Africa altogether in June for PACE 2020. Uh, that's about it for me right now. I would love to welcome Ismail as our moderator for today's panel. Ismail. Thank you very much, Owen, and good afternoon to all of you, global citizens. Whilst the pandemic holds us back and we cannot assemble, it's great that FACE has enabled us to be able to assemble in, uh, in this particular way, on an online medium. In our webinar this afternoon, we hope to explore the pace for creative disruption on the continent, and we'll conclude this afternoon's webinar with a creative intervention by uh, the artist Sonia Rademeyer. Uh, we'll just touch briefly on Sonia Rademeyer. She was born in Zimbabwe, studied in the Netherlands, and is living in South Africa, but she works across the globe. Uh, Sonia in, collects soil from wherever she travels, and she also asks people to bring soil to her from other parts of the continent. And our website says that at a very personal level, soil holds the association of authenticity for her. 
but on a social and political level, soil or land is highly charged with associations of displacement and trauma through, con through colonization. Now, the issue of land, identity and belonging is a matter that is central to the heartbeat of all artists. And the panel this afternoon, I have four wonderful artists who will share and talk about their work. Uh, the first is Zerihun Birahanu, who is from uh, Addis Ababa, studied at the Addis Ababa University. He then pursued a graduate degree at the University of Warwick in the UK and at the University of the Arts in Belgrade in Serbia. His focus is on international performance research and his research interests are the relationship between theater and politics in Ethiopia. In his book, uh, Ethiopian Theater Ideas of Modernity and Nation Building, he traced back the historical beginnings of Ethiopian theater and shows how the early theater was influenced and shaped by the ideas of modernity and the process of nation formation in the country. By giving social, political, and artistic account on the history of the beginning of the 20th century in Ethiopia, he argues that the trend for theater should be scrutinized. We hope that that's what we'd probably be able to do this afternoon. My second panelist is uh, Nada Sabit, uh, an Egyptian theater director. She believes that art should offer entertainment and joy, as well as open the doors of dialogue, that art should raise awareness, it should educate and play, uh, other than just, it should, it should educate, play, and also offer enlightening roles to people. In 2011, she co-founded the performing arts company uh, Noon Creative Enterprise. Nada's passion for the theater began when she was a child performing in a school drama production. She went on to study theater uh, in, in Egypt, majoring in psychology and then to the American University in Cairo. It was followed by a master's degree in creative entrepreneurship in the United Kingdom. Her work engages in often, often contentious and controversial issues such as circumcision, sexual harassment, street children, dreams, participation of youth, the media, racism, migration, and the portrayal of women in the media and law. The third panelist is from Uganda, Beatrice Lamwaka, who is an acclaimed novelist uh, and was shortlisted in 2011 for the Kane Prize for Literature. Beatrice is a member of Transcend Art and Peace, an organization that supports creativity and art in working for peace. Now, apart from writing her novels, she has also written about issues affecting women, including HIV AIDS and the impact on war on women and social justice. With the grant that she received from the H. F. Guggenheim Foundation, she researched land in post-conflict northern Uganda. She holds a master's degree in human rights from Makerere University in Uganda. And finally, the fourth panelist is from South Africa, Hamish Neal. He studied at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg and then worked as a project manager for Drama for Life. He was the brainchild behind the social change project Build a President that asked pertinent questions about democracy, constitution building, active and responsible citizenship, such as how do we enhance the role of democratic leadership amongst all youth, and how can we foster generations of youth to live the legacy of Nelson Mandela. For all my panelists, a central focus of their work is about interrogating the status quo and disrupting it where necessary. This afternoon's discussion, creative disruption and disobedient on the continent, will explore some of their motives in their work and the creative movements, but also focus, uh, more than just focusing on their work, we also want to explore the pertinent questions about creative disruption. That is, creative disruption is not a new term. It was used in the early 1940s by the advertising and branding movement. And this afternoon's discussion, we'd like to also explore how community and stakeholder engagement is crucial to successful creative disruption interventions. We also want to explore how we deal with advocacy and the issues of accountability when disrupting. We'd like to look at how emerging technologies and social media also serves as either a tool or as a hindrance in the movement. Now, my role in this webinar is quite easy. All I need to do is I need to just set the, 
the, the mood and get my panelists to argue, talk to each other and to engage you. And that I hope that you as the audience will also participate in the creative disruption process by contributing to the chat box on your screen. And all your questions and your comments will be fed to us and that I hope that the panel will be able to engage with your questions as well. So to kick off, I'm going to ask each of the four panelists to briefly spell out just in, in the introduction, what is the political, the economic and the social environment in which you operate and what is it that you wish to disrupt and to what end? Uh, so I'm gonna repeat that again, is that can each of the panelists briefly spell out what is the political, the economical and the social environment in which you operate and what is it that you wish to disrupt and to what end? So it's over to the panel and they'll take that one by one. Shall I start off with you, Beatrice? Don't forget your microphones as you go on to unmute yourself. Okay, um, I do have my, I think uh, Isabel will share my presentation, so. Sure. Okay, your presentation first. Okay, thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, my presentation will focus mainly uh, on issues and how things are ongoing in Uganda. And of course, it's not, uh, I'm not giving every detail to everything, but this is just a discussion to, you know, to, to, so that you can get an idea of what is happening in Uganda. Um, Isabel, I can have the next one. Okay, uh, for us, Ugandans are basically um, artists by nature. Different people are doing different forms of art, um, fashion, poetry, we, we baskets, we compose songs, we create stories and do all these different forms of art. Um, whereas in Uganda, we, we have uh, the, the constitution allows for freedom of expression. And of course it, uh, it guarantees the right to engage in peaceful activities and influence policies through civic actions. The government, the same government has also passed a series of repressive laws that has expanded a number of government regulatory bodies which mandate which have mandates to oversee control and monitor and so with the same hand where you know we are allowed to express the same hand is also controlling what we say and what we do um also it's very important for you to note that we've had the same president since 1986 and so that means that um we have a government that wants to stay in place and um, all the disruptive uh, uh, arts that are available are going to be you know, suppressed, or especially if they feel that it's going to affect, um, to affect what they are saying. So there are a number of uh, artists or writers that have done incredibly a number of things to, you know, and, and of course we have seen how they are handled. Uh, so the first one I'll mention is uh, Dr. Stella Nyanzi. She's of course a feminist and a writer and she uses radical rudeness to voice uh, unhappiness with the current regime. Of course, uh, she was in jail for a year for a point that she posted on Facebook. And, um, and while she was in prison, she also wrote a number of poems, um, and we also have her collection of short story, I mean, collection of poetry, which is uh, No Roses From My Mouth. Uh, and, and at the moment, she's running for a uh, Kampala member of parliament, and I hope that she will be able to win and, you know, so that she keeps uh, highlighting some of the issues that uh, affect our society. So uh, just, I, uh, got an extract of one of the points that um, she has written so that uh, you can actually see how she's uh, disrupting 
uh, the status quo in Uganda. And to this poem, she wrote uh, to the president of Uganda. And here it goes. Dear Wari, they say it was your birthday yesterday. How morbidly, how morbidly grave a day. I wish that Esther's cast genitals had pushed out a monstrously greenish, bluish steel bath. You should have died at birth, you dirty, delinquent dictator. You should have died in birth, you were in Kaguta seven. And uh, you can already see that um, writing to uh, a president who has been in power for um, for 30 something years, I stopped counting. Um, you will know that definitely he's not going to sit quietly uh, as you say things like that. And that's why she had to spend some time in prison for her writing. And she continues to speak and write. And uh, there are many of her points that I could have read and you just see what kind of person she is. Okay. Um, and the second one is Bobby Wine, um, whose real name is Robert Chagulani. Uh, he's a musician turned politician. Of course, he has been arrested as many times. Uh, he has been injured a number of times. Uh, at one point, he had to seek medical uh, treatment in the US. Uh, and there are always trump up charges against him. And um, of course, we know he gained his popularity through his music. And um, according to uh, media, of course, he has been, uh, his concerts now have been um, canceled as, as many times as 125 times. And that's a lot for a musician. Um, that means, of course, um, there's a system that is trying to uh, suppress your economic um, income. Uh, he's also running for president uh, in our upcoming election early next year. So yeah, it's a rough situation here. Uh, the other artist, uh, Kagaino uh, Gobi, he's a, poem, a performance poet who also calls himself a protest poet. He's very uh, vocal on issues that are affecting us. And he's very aware that um, sometimes when he performs, he's not sure if you know he's going to walk out of stage alive or anything. So he's well aware of uh, what could happen. And um, some of his poetry has already been banned from being performed at the National Theater. And it's also strange in a way that because he's always performing at the National Theater when he has the opportunity. And so, some of this one, they told him, do not, whatever happens. But he has also a company that has been able to, you know, include young poets and also, you know, give them the courage to also continue to do whatever they can do. So I will just read a bit of um, Kagai's poem, which he has written. Uh, the, the title is In 2065. The president will be the president. Oh, sorry, the president will be the president we have today. And in a wheelchair, he will give the nation address. Only his son, then a field marshal, will read on his behalf. He will talk on his behalf. He will rule on his behalf. In 2065, nothing will have changed that much, except I will be over seven. And for now he's in his parties, so we can imagine. Okay. And, and also we have a number of um, writers organization or arts organizations that are doing things that are disrupting the status quo that um, probably are being done for the first time. So we have Ugandan Pen uh, through the project Hannah's the Rare Voices uh, trained prisoners to write um, whatever stories that they could and um, their work has been 
published in an anthology which is called As I Stood Dead Before the World. Um, we all know we have very negative attitudes whoever has been to prison or, and we don't think they have a lot of sense, but here in Uganda for the first time, we have uh, prisoners who are telling their stories. And then we have also FemRight. FemRight is a women organization that has trained so many women uh, and provided support for them to write and voice uh, whatever issues that they have. And uh, we, uh, FemRight has published more than 40 books and the women have received national and international recognition for their contribution. Of course, FemRight was just founded recently in 1996, but before that, there was hardly any publication by, um, by women in Uganda. And so this has changed the literary scene um, forever for us. Um, so I conclude by saying that, you know, as artists, we will, uh, we will continue to create no matter the circumstances, whether there are repressive laws, whether we've had the same president forever, whether, you know, uh, and use whatever we have to make sure that we say what we say. And of course, whether we are threatened, whether we are doing the things that we should do, um, whether we say obvious things and uh, are still arrested for them. Because um, I uh, recently, um, a comedian group was arrested for um, doing a skit on nep nepotism in Uganda. And um, for us, it's very clear that, you know, this, it's an obvious thing. So why arrest people for saying it? Um, and then it's also very important that we recognize um, and honor the bravery and uh, selflessness of some of the writers who have stood naked to power so that they're able to uh, disrupt and say whatever they do. Uh, so I say more power to artists. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you very much, Beatrice. I think one of the key things that you raise is that whilst a country may have a constitution and may guarantee freedom of expression, that freedom of expression and so forth is often curtailed by regulations and policies, which are often not consistent with the values of a constitution. And that gives rise to the kind of artist movements that then begin to challenge the state. And I think there's one thing that you talk about in the end, which is about the recognition that those artists receive. And I think this is something we'd like to come back later on in the, in the discussion that is the kind of recognition that artists who engage in the creative disruption movement receive, but not necessarily from their own state, but or the agencies in their state, but rather very often uh, where those sources of recognition come that then support the kind of work. And we'll talk about this when we talk about the, the, the issue of, of stakeholder engagement. I'm going to move to Zerihon Biharu to, to take us into your country uh, in Ethiopia and the, the the, the role of arts is there. Thank you very much. Um, I just will talk about a little bit survey of how um, the artists used um, uh, inter interruptions or um, new methods in challenging, especially the, the political atmosphere in Ethiopia. Starting from the first performance, the first theater, which was introduced in 1913 by a man called Taklara Taklamarem, who was in Europe uh, and then came back to Ethiopia. And so uh, in one of the days he was invited to see a performance. So he went, uh, uh, so I'm gonna talk about the forms of uh, theaters. So he went to see theater, which he said um, is no theater. So he, he said uh, th there, was a, there was a dance, there was a music, which was uh, an indigenous kind of performance. He said, this is no theater. So if you want uh, to do a theater, you, you, should, you should do it in European form. So he started to write the first play, and then which was considered to be the first uh, kind of modern play in Ethiopian theater history. So he introduced the play in one way to show how theater is done, in the other way uh, to challenge the political status of the time. And uh, so the first theater, when it was staged for the first time, it was banned. 
So the queen, at the moment, if she was a uh, queen Zauditu, she banned the play because she thought that it's uh, it's a, a criticism against her government, her, against her, her monarchy. So she banned it. So, um, and then in the 1960, in the 1974, when uh, when the revolution happened against the Emperor Haile Selassie, there started to become a new kind of theater, theater styles. For example, there was a, a new form of theater that promotes uh, a socialist kind of performances. Uh, and then to 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 uh, to instruct and support the government to 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 go toward the socialism. So for 17 years, uh, Ethiopia was uh, was led by a, a, a military government, which claims to be a socialist one. So the plays that were produced, the music that was produced at the moment, were supportive of this kind of political regime. So the form is were also changed from being more realistic to kind of uh, uh, Brexian kind of performances with participatory uh, uh, elements. So there were some playwrights, a few playwrights who tried to challenge this status quo and then uh, tried to write against the forms and against the government uh, uh, political structure. But unfortunately, some of them were uh, during that the moment were persecuted, some of them imprisoned and then in 1991, there was again another change of government. So the one that we have right now. So during this time, as uh, Beatrice was saying, uh, uh, we, we had an official constitutional right to say whatever we want through the arts, through theater, through music, through, uh, through uh, literature or visual art. But practically it's not allowed. So, for example, if one of uh, one of the if if one playwright or director wants to direct a play and is staged for the national theater, which is against the government policies or the government way of uh, method of uh, governing the country, uh, there is it is very improbable for for the director to stage at the national or any kind of theater for that matter. So there were also uh, some, some directors and playwrights who tried to challenge again, these forms of uh, writing plays and then try to find alternative ways of uh, staging performances. For example, um, two playwrights, Manezo and and then one is um, uh, uh, Maza Walko, who tried to show their performances outside of the theater houses so that they can get some kind of audience reception and then get rid of the government control system. But it was not that much successful. So one of the challenge here is that uh, despite the, the, the uh, pressure from the government to state performances, uh, which can be critical against the government, there is also a challenge of uh, uh, staging performances in, 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 in conventional kind of, kind of theater. For example, people still want to see, or the theater houses still want to stage plays that are kind of European in their form, in their content. So there are some few few playwrights who try to even incorporate kind of uh, the, the, the rich resources of indigenous performance forms as a, a challenge for this kind of theaters and then try to stage performances. I also have tried uh, uh, to do experimental kind of theaters in, in Addis Ababa University and also for the National Theater, uh, despite their low attendance and then despite their low uh, acceptance from the theaters. Super, thank you very much for that. I think you touch on key issues for us that we all experience in most parts of the globe, that is people who do the kind of contentious disruptive work would often have struggling audiences, particularly in, in national theaters or those particular state run theaters. But the key, uh, a, 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 another question that you also raised there is the, the question of bannings of artists and the banning of, of work, uh, particularly in countries where there are constitutions on the one hand, the talk of freedom of expression, but end up with bannings. Let's move to Nada and then we come back to, we go to uh, Hermish and then we, we get into dialogue with each other. So Nada, if you can paint the picture for us in your country, please. Hello, um, well, Egypt, well, structurally, uh, officially follows a more Soviet uh, model where arts are a service to the people. So, and on one hand, there are kind of 
theater, they call them houses or palaces. They're basically buildings um, all over the country. Uh, they're unfortunately mostly closed uh, or non-functional. Um, and they follow, they are all part of the Ministry of Culture. So there are kind of these two separate systems uh, for the arts that run in parallel in Egypt. One that comes from the Ministry of Culture that's supported by the ministry, uh, where uh, artists and uh, cultural operators are ministry employees. Uh, and then there's a whole other independent sector that relies on um, working with European counterparts, the counterparts in the West, to support uh, the creation of performances um, uh, and they are independent of that whole ministry structure. Um, and at various points, these kind of two parallel systems have ignored the existence of each other, um, but have also shown that they don't like each other and have also tried to work with each other at various times. Um, so that's kind of one view of what's happening. Uh, recently, however, though, there have been a lot of um, banning of uh, things like foreign funding. So the Egyptian government is making it very hard for uh, independent entities from NGOs all the way to small uh, theater collectives and um, arts um, groups. Uh, to uh, kind of find funding outside of the, the kind of the formalized, um, um, the formula, like the more government run stuff, which they're not really eligible to use much of the time. So that has kind of closed down a lot of spaces, independent spaces, and also institutions, as well as made it hard for smaller, younger groups to kind of um, come up and actually practice um, their art forms. Um, so within that structure lives a noon creative enterprise, for instance, I will use my own company as an example of how these systems work or could work together and how the disruption of it is a lot part of the identity of um, the work I personally do and the work of a few other people also. Um, so Noon Creative Enterprise is an enterprise, it's a company, so it's not, it is neither officially part of the ministry, even though we do, we are able to work because we are a registered company. Um, uh, and we are originally more from the independent um, scene and sector but we are formalized structure because we are a company. So that allows us to kind of navigate both uh, somewhat independent worlds uh, without really being part of one fully, but able to engage both. And a lot of the time, because of this interesting uh, space we hold, we are able to bring in uh, both parties uh, to work together uh, and also choose which, um, which format to kind of create work. So it also allows us this agility in uh, bringing in, in creating projects and working. And it also kind of opens up the space we can use in the works uh, we create and present. Um, we're also, a, I guess we follow so the system we use is also a disruption of, um, I would say classical uh, performing arts formats. So we work a lot in communities where we really rely on um, the community to invite us in. So a lot of the time we present uh, works outside people's homes where it's a bit, it's an invitation from a community or a person in the community, as opposed to an entity or an organization. Uh, but that said, we also work with 
uh, schools and, uh, and institutions, but it allows us that agility to, to move uh, across the spaces, uh, which has allowed us to present uh, works in greater numbers in unexpected places. A lot of our audiences are first time uh, theater goers um, in very remote uh, areas around Egypt where there isn't the president, they've not seen any theater uh, or participated in a workshop of this kind uh, before. So a lot of the time it's their first experience and therefore um, a lot of artists that we work with have to kind of get used to that people will not adhere to sitting in rows, they might walk around in the middle, uh, women might breastfeed and all that is okay. Young kids might come in and look for their parents. Um, someone might eat something. I mean, it, it, sometimes it's outdoors and cars might pass. Um, and sometimes it's indoors in a theater structure that's ticketed in the city. And it really kind of has allowed us this whole breadth of uh, movement uh, and working with different people. And I think the variety in our partners and the people, communities, organizations we are able to work with kind of allows us to stay functioning and to not really uh, bother anybody too much. And therefore we are allowed to continuously exist in, uh, in this space. Um, and then the other side of what we do would be kind of disruption through the topics we use and the artistic formats we use, um, where we are able to create um, works that are very light, that can move around, that aren't very uh, design intensive, um, as well as create works that are more classically kind of in the Western view, theatrical performances that take place on a theater with an audience um, and have bigger sets and more elaborate uh, design um, in them. Um, but also our topics a lot of the time are uh, come from the communities we go to. Uh, we've had a quite a successful partnership to create a performance on female genital mutilation that has been performed in over 500 uh, places, spaces, viewings um, around Egypt. Um, uh, and it's a slapstick comedy. So in itself, the choice to talk about a very um, loaded uh, topic uh, through using um, comedy and slapstick uh, is a disruption of how female gentle mutilation as a topic has been um, uh, expressed or talked about um, through the development world for the past uh, 50 years in Egypt, where it's a very kind of solemn, serious, uh, top-down conversation, uh, but never kind of uh, in the use of comedy, we are able to get people to laugh with us. And then kind of, it allows everybody to kind of ease into the topic and it creates a space where people can learn together and discuss together and there isn't a top down i know what you need to do and this is what needs to happen and there isn't that whole drama of the people are dying and this is really bad it kind of frees the space from these uh, two systems or modalities of uh, that are more development uh, oriented for instance uh, and allows communities to really come together and discuss this topic with curiosity um, uh, and a kind of more joyful angle to why is it that we do this to begin with and what does it really do and uh, and how do we do we really want this or could we think of something else we want and you know and that curiosity is not necessarily present in the other formats um, I won't uh, I'll talk about all our projects, but this is just an example that uh, that I would like to use. We've also managed to work in um, mental health institutions. We do things in corporate uh, 
uh, settings. And in that, it kind of also disrupts the clear lines that the world has boxed. You know, a lot of the time, uh, especially performing arts companies kind of cater to one very select uh, audience. So we only work with mental health or we only work on female uh, gender issues or whatever. Uh, we only work with children. We work with everybody. And I think that's kind of helped free us of, uh, of uh, quite a lot of, and disrupt the models that exist for what performing arts companies can, could, should, ought to um, do in the work they do. It, on the back, I mean, on the downside, it also confuses people, <laughs> uh, this variety. Uh, but so far we've been happy to live with it. And, and for us at the core, we're a performing arts company. So the topics, we're happy for the topics to change uh, and for the formats and for the, the, you know, we can do puppets this time, next time we'll do more physical theater or more classical theater or more interactive. And that allows us also the creative space to, to, to stay engaged and to stay uh, curious and focused and, uh, and inspired. Super, no, no, let's take it till there and uh, I'll come back to you in a short while. But I think you, you, what you're saying to us in a nutshell is that even in a country where theater is considered to be a service to the people, it's often not funded by a state when the, you don't speak the master's voice. Uh, and that you you often end up finding sources of funding from outside of your country. And one of the things that we we continually deal with on this continent is is the amount of funding that we get for the work that we do in the arts, uh, particularly from the West. And that does talk to kind of stakeholder relationships, but it also talks around the kind of relationships that we have, and also to some extent around agendas. I think one of the things that you raise with this is, is, is quite interesting is that the way in which you work, uh, where you, you don't necessarily fall within or lock yourselves in within the conventions or the norms uh, of, of, of conventional theater in some way. But I think the key thing that you picked up was that although you deal with very serious issues of circumcision, gender violence, the brutality and whatever else, is that you never lose the element of laughter uh, in the activism. And I think that's something we're gonna pick up again in this conversation, because very often when we think of trying to disrupt and trying to create this kind of work that works in the field of advocacy, we seldom consider the element of laughter. But let's go to Hamish and we come back to that in the, in the dialogue that we begin to have with each other. Hamish, we come to you and we pick up on the land of Mr. Zuma. <laughs> Indeed. Well, well, it, it is and it isn't in many ways. That's both horrifying and, and encouraging. Um, greeting to, to greetings to everyone who, who's on the call and my fellow panelists. Uh, thank you to Pace for organizing this. Um, well, the South African context, I think, is, is one that's very complex. And um, just listening to two fellow, fellow presenters and Ismail, also your, your opening, um, I decided to, to shift slightly my attack in terms of responding to this question. I think um, trying to speak to the sort of political, social, and, and economic context that we operate in, um, it goes without saying that, that, that South Africa still is pretty much one of the, the most unequal countries in the world economically. And, and that, that is so replicated in the work that is done um, in, in our country and to a larger extent, even within our region. I think um, South Africa being the sort of like focus, both um, e economically and politically in the region, ripples through in many different ways. Um, but I won't go into that too much, but I think I'll, I'll ch I choose to start there. This, this sort of um, deep inequality that we have, that is not just economic, but also socially um, in terms of gender and, and, and access. So it, it permeates and is present in, in all aspects of our society. Um, and therefore um, our art space um, is both very much shaped and, 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 and energized and agentized by that reality. So um, in one sense, you can say that, that, that we, we, we thankfully have a ministry of now sports, arts, and culture, um, as there's been a lot of political sort of turmoil ongoing and ministries have been amalgamated. And one of ours, uh, one of the results has been that we've, we've now been incorporated with sports um, and that has had its own sort of ramifications. 
Um, and but from this, this ministerial status, you then have various sort of parastatal elements and wings that then sort of ad ad administer the sort of agenda of the state, as it were, um, around the sort of arts and culture sector. Um, and again, I won't, I won't go in, into all of that detail, but essentially one thing that is key to note is that there is, in theory, um, very clear structures, um, very clear, clear budget lines that are meant to be driving into and, and, and supporting the arts practices in South Africa. I think very recently, um, and, and, and it, it is well known and well documented, uh, our struggle politically um, with corruption. And I think, unfortunately, our, our sector is not, is not outside of that, that criticism. Uh, we are sort of wrapped up in that as well. So I think that that's one place to start at. Um, and then so, sort of going quite directly towards Drama for Life and how we've been working in relationship to that and how in a way we sort of try and intersect and cut across um, all the various elements and, and presences within our very complex art, uh, art and culture sector. So we know historically um, we have a, a very rich culture and, and, and it's rich by virtue of, of, of its presence globally, its, its celebration go globally, but that is of our sort of protest theater movement and protest action, which still, still I, I would argue today very much sort of flavors and, and underpins a lot of South Africa's um, artistic work, whether it references it directly or simply that that, that aesthetic um, is, still, is still referenced and used quite widely. I think also um, quite interestingly, the sort of uh, economic availability or, or inavailability um, means that a lot of the sort of protest theater aesthetic is present today simply because it was art that was um, e easy to make, um, quite mobile, quite dynamic. Um, and even its style is, is still somewhat, somewhat referenced and used quite, quite, quite popularly in many spaces across South Africa. Um, I think though what is also quite interesting in the space that Drama for Life um, sits in is this relationship between the sort of university spaces and research and the sort of various arts movements and programs that, that we have going on um, across South Africa. I know Johannesburg and Cape Town in particular um, have some very interesting um, relationships and connections with sort of university spaces and, and the creative research space, and then art, uh, community arts programs or even arts activist programs. Um, just to mention one name that jumps to mind, but Alex Sutherland, for example, who's now based in Cape Town, uh, is, is one such researcher and practitioner um, through the, the, the Tsitsimani Center for Activist Education is one group, for example, that, that stands out as a space where this intersection is used in quite a constructive way. Um, and, and we see a sort of breaking down of the, the institution, as it were, the, the, the very historical um, and, and traditional notion of the institution, and then how that, that knowledge and space intersects with community activism and arts work. But that's just one, there's many, many others. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning a few other practitioners like, like, like Mamela Nyamza, um, Koleka uh, Putuma, um, Ndumbiso and Samanga, who is based at Drama for Life at the moment, and, and, and Zanella Maholi, who are some of the other activists who are doing incredible work. Um, and just to close, I think at Drama for Life, what, what we've been really focusing on is a large part of what the fellow colleagues have mentioned um, have been doing, historically what has been happening, and then um, in a contemporary sense, trying to break down these structures that are present um, to, 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 in many cases, drive this inequality, but also silo um, the work that is happening so that there isn't a beautiful flow and exchange of knowledge and access, but a restriction of that. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to ask you before I just, I know you, you, you've raised a number of issues and we'll talk about that, but for the delegates who are not South African, you've made references to Mamela Nyamza and you've made reference to one or two others. Could I just ask that in a very brief sentence, you just mm. articulate what they do so that uh, they don't just remain names in this discussion, but that we have some understanding and some reference to the work that they do. Fantastic. Well, well um, Mamela Nyamza is, is a dancer and activist in her own right. Um, and she has been doing for many, many, many years, successful and potent activist work using her dance. Most recently, she, she's taken um, our, our state theater based in Pretoria to task um, around, around gender-based inequality at work and various other issues. Um, and then uh, Koleka Putuma is, is, a, is a performance poet and activist also based in Cape Town, um, who's been doing incredible work around gender-based violence and gender equity in South Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to remind the, the delegates in this room that we do have a chat room and you also have the Facebook 
uh, discussions. So please feel free to participate in this discussion. You can comment, you can add, we've seen a number of comments coming up, but you can also throw questions which the delegates, uh, which the panelists will take and answer. I'm going to move to another part around you. This is the use of emerging technologies and social media. And I'm referring to this particularly because at the time when we, we, we all cannot gather and we all cannot work, uh, the way that we're doing so we cannot work in the normal way, but the way we're doing is at the moment through technology. Through So whilst you cannot engage with your audiences and your constituencies, how are each of you using technology in your work as you go along? Nadia, shall we start off with you? Um, I mean, it really depends on who our audiences are for technology. Um, we have learned that going into remote villages with a lot of technology, it doesn't really work because a lot of the time there isn't even electricity. Um, but even within that, uh, we have tried to uh, kind of create our own little gadgets and things that can uh, kind of inspire uh, some creativity. Um, but that said, we do for things that are more in the city, uh, we have done um, a few things with technology. We've been attempting to also, with all the lockdown stuff, there have been a few online platforms for ticket sales and viewing of performances. Um, I cannot say how successful or unsuccessful they are, but we have a few shows that are kind of on there. Um, and I guess at the end of the month, I kind of find out if, if we made any money, I don't know. <laughs> um, we've also been toying with creating uh, shows specifically to be consumed uh, with a mix of technology and social distancing where phone calls or letters or Zoom are kind of all mixed together. Um, and we shall start, we're hoping, uh, uh, we've already started testing some, but we haven't actually presented it as a show yet. Um, but yeah, that's our next. Uh... Right. I think I think it's 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 interesting that you talked earlier about having the kind of direct access and direct engagement with your communities, and now with uh, a different way of communication. In some way, the digital divide is enormous, and not everyone can access uh, can have access to you in the way that they may have had. But I'm going to go back to Hamish, because I know with his particular group, uh, Drama for Life, they've, they've used technology incredibly well, uh, particularly in your Build a President campaign. You want to talk about that briefly? Yes, definitely. So um, Build a President was actually a campaign we started uh, right before the sort of Zuma era, as it were, politically came in. Um, and with all the energy and concern around that, uh, we were just sort of trying to simply use at that moment was really sort of the sort of starting of, of, of the selfie culture, the meme culture, um, really starting to, to take hold in society. And, and so noting, um, as we have done historically, that access to certain spaces and places has always been restricted, we said, well, social media is a great place to get this conversation going. I mean, there was so much happening on television and on radio, but it was always experts who were given the, the sort of pound seats to speak back to it. So we would go to places, um, even with our students, because we are based at university and have post-grad students, and told them, take out your phone, ask somebody the simple question, what would it take, or, or what qualities would you put in to build a president? And whatever answers they gave, they wrote down on a piece of paper, held it up, and that became their form of activism. And um, that's been running continuously ever since. Um, it has also got us in quite a lot of trouble. We've been followed by many political organizations since then. Um, but a simple use of, 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 of the, the written word and image online um, for years now has been running and is still sustained quite well. Great. Getting into trouble is great. But I think getting into trouble also comes along with issues of accountability. Uh, so I'm going to go to Zerihun. Zerihun, I'm going to ask you the question around, uh, you know, it's great to do all this kind of advocacy that we do. But what is the accountability that we have uh, when we cause trouble, when we disrupt? Well, it depends, I, I think. Um, because in one way, uh, the, the accountability comes in one way in the forms of the performance that we do. 
the forms that we disrupt from the, the, the mainstream kind of performance. In that case, I think we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, very bad reviews, obviously, and also uh, a lack of, uh, lack of spaces to perform. But thematically, if we are going to, for example, here, if we are going to challenge the status quo, especially the political status quo, it's obvious that you're not going to show. If it's simple, your performance will be banned. The, if it is far more than that, you're going to pay. That's obvious. But isn't that good? I mean, it is also for me, for example, having that kind of challenges somehow makes the, the performance or the, the, the kind of art we're making more visible to the others. For example, in Ethiopian music industry, uh, there, is, there is this famous singer called Teddy Afro who tried to challenge the status quo with his music. So he became famous when his mix were banned from television and radios and then got a lot of acceptance. Now he's one of the top musicians in the country. So in one way, it's also uh, a, a, a blessing in, in, you know, in challenges. So I think the, 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 the challenges that we're facing by challenging the status quo is in one way, it's very important for the development, even for the arts. Personally, it's going to be very challenging. Personally, it's going to some, sometimes going to be very far, the, 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 the repercussions of doing challenging the status quo. But in the forms, it actually adds something to the existing um, uh, mainstream performance art, whether it's in theater or in music. Because we have seen, uh, we have seen so many experimental performances in Addis over the last couple of years who tried to uh, use alternative spaces and alternative kind of uh, uh, creating performances. Uh, even though they didn't get uh, as much as uh, they wanted audiences or receptions, but still they are becoming very influential. In, in discussing new forms, in challenging the, the, the status quo. So I, I see it in that perspective, rather than the challenge that uh, that that came along with uh, challenging the status quo. Super, thank you very much. I think you raised a key question there, which leads us into something that's raised by um, uh, one of the delegates here as well. Uh, and that is the question of audiences. I'm gonna to go to Beatrice and ask the question, Beatrice, are audiences ready for the disruption and the disobedience? Does it not make them feel uncomfortable uh, when they're sitting and sometimes watching things that they're not necessarily used to or which is not within their conventional experience of theater? So over to you, Beatrice. <coughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, uh, one thing that has come to mind has been um, I remember there was a, a show in Uganda about um, the effects of war in northern Uganda. And so uh, this playwright had written about uh, a rape scene. And uh, as the audience watched the rape scene, people laughed. And so the question was, were they laughing to deal with the, you know, how uncomfortable they were, or was it really uh, comic in itself? Um, and I think that the audience, uh, of course, uh, plays a big role in the arts and their reaction or how they deal with things is, uh, is very important. And uh, I, for us, of course, um, we are meant to believe that uh, Ugandans don't read. And so if you write a book, there are chances that uh, they probably won't read it. But we know that uh, people read and they will definitely read uh, a book that they find of, of interest. And, and even in Uganda, I've noted uh, recently a novelist was arrested uh, for writing a book called um, The Greedy Barbarian. And uh, of course, uh, that means that the regime probably interpreted that they were talking about them uh, uh, and with, the, with that uh, uh, symbol of uh, barbarian. And, and now 
that has created a lot of interest in the book and everyone wants to read and find out why was this writer arrested. Um, and I, I guess the issue when, when you burn something, when you restrict something, uh, the, the, the audience gets interested and they want to know and they want to know. And uh, maybe instead of silencing something, then it's highlighted, uh, which of course is important that all the artwork is highlighted so that um, it serves its purpose. Super, thank you very much. So it's, it's, it's getting, it's, it's building your audience, taking them on the journey with you as well. Uh, the laughter helps a great deal. Uh, let's get to that question that we raised earlier. And that's the question around funding. Uh, because we, we spoke earlier that very often the funding we're getting for the kind of work that we do is often not the funding from home. And that very often this funding is coming in from the West. Uh, is that funding coming in with particular agendas? How do we begin to nurture funding relationships within our own communities, the communities for whom we disrupt, for whom uh, we, we want change, the kind of social change and so forth. How do we begin to find those relationships within those communities to begin to sustain our work uh, and that we lead this to the kind of sustainable change that we wanna see uh, as a result of our disruption. Let's go to you Zerihun. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge now, and uh, that's a, that's a big question: how to be, how to sustain this type of uh, uh, performances. That's really uh, one of the the key questions that we are raising right now, even here. Uh, this because, uh, as you know, the, we don't we don't have uh, critical support from the government concerning the arts, uh, even without disrupting the status quo. You don't get enough enough funding from the government for the artists. And uh, we, we have a government that considers the, the arts as the second or third part of the strategic plan of development or something like that. So um, one of the challenges is the funding. I think uh, for us, for example, we're trying to create kind of alternative uh, funding, funding uh, 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 partners. For example, uh, uh, it's a good luck for us here in Addis because we have so many international NGOs here, the African Union is here. So we look for potentials, potential partners to do, to do uh, our thing. Uh, I know that's also uh, problematic if you want to do your own, them your thematically, if you want to do your own performance form. Uh, so if there is a fund, there is something that comes along with this. So you have to align this, these two things together. And the other thing is uh, well, the, the, here the entertainment industry is kind of struggling to grow. So there is, there is a, a good amount of exchange, exchange of currencies here. So sh having alternative stage to do your performance sometimes might be a, a very, very good opportunity. Sometimes as I, as I did before, not. So you, you look for this, this good opportunity of getting some kind of, uh, some kind of income from uh, performing, performing yeah, from showing you performances. But I say that's, that's a key, the, the key challenge of doing performances that can uh, uh, disrupt the status quo. Yeah. We have just a few more minutes before I hand back to Erwin. Uh, so I'm gonna take this as the round, last round of questions with each of the panelists. Maybe you could all respond to, this, to the very same question. Because you started off with discussing the, the, the status quo in your country and what you're trying to disrupt and so forth. I'd like you to ask, answer the question, uh, what is the kind of sustainable change that you would like to see uh, as a result of what you're doing? What, what is the outcome that you would love to see that is sustainable? Let's go to you, uh, Hamish, and then we move around. Start from home and let's move out. Thank you. Thank you, Ismail. Um, I think for us at Drama for Life, it centers around what we've done with our academic program. Um, and what, what we focus on there is to not be the ones creating the art, but to share the tools that ourselves, the staff members and the guest artists we have that come through our program with future artists so that um, it's not held by a small group, but it, it proliferates through across society um, into spaces that many of us would never be because our student body comes from so many se sections and places in the country. 
And I think that's always been our sustainable key is not to be the ones holding the information, being the sole experts, but to share that knowledge um, and really get, get people empowered in their own right to make art with or, or without the support of the government and other funding streams. Great, Nada, let's hear from you. Uh, I think for us was to kind of really, I mean, it's quite similar to kind of prove through what we do that you can find a way to, uh, to make it happen <laughs> uh, and to, and that no topic is particularly too uh, untouchable, but that it's more about how you choose to tackle certain topics um, and express them that allows others to get excited about it and to support it, whether it's for uh, the audience or for uh, money or for support, I mean, whatever kind of support, but for artists to really kind of feel that they can uh, if they choose to, and that there are ways of thinking of things outside all the little boxes we live in that allow this to happen. Super. Beatrice? Uh, for us in Uganda, I, I realize that one of the things is that artists censor themselves a lot. Uh, we know the red lines and we don't cross them. It's only very few artists who cross the red line because they're brave and uh, yeah. And I want to see a situation where artists can create whatever they want to create without censoring themselves. Um, and then um, our, our government uh, spent most of the time uh, want finding ways in which to tax the artists to get money from the artists without supporting the artists in any way. And so I want, if it's possible, you know, we get support from our government because they want money from us, give us support so that we can excel and then you can get some money from us. Super, Zeriun? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's my, my opinion is almost similar to with, uh, with Beatrice. I'm having, a, having an open space where you can do whatever you want not in a sense of uh, 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 an anarchical kind of whatever you want, but uh, uh, in, in, in artistically open space. So I don't think the, the others will be a big problem. The, the funding and other people, I don't think will be the uh, problem. The problem is having a very good space where you can express uh, and all uh, in the forms itself. In, any form you want. So if that's if that's um, a real thing, I think there will be a lot of changes. Right. Thank you very much. What I'm going to take away from you is just five little points. Uh, that is in in creating the kind of work that we do, that we should not try to hold passion too 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 tightly onto what we do, but that we should be work, working towards empowering society by sharing the tools that we have. We need to excite people. We need to work without censorship, but we need to lobby for funding and that we should move to creating any kind of form and that our audiences uh, are crucial in the kind of work that we do and how we engage them. With that, I'm gonna hand you back to Erwin Maas. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panel. Thanks to you as delegates. Thanks to the questions that came up as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ismail. Thank, thank you, you Ismail, much. and thank you, panelists. What a wonderful panel. Really, really uh, so thought-provoking. And it just, uh, again, gives me always this idea, uh, particularly in this case when we were talking about government, that uh, I'm so convinced that more artists uh, should be in government, which, of course, we kind of don't want to because we want to make art. But I, what the world would look different if artists were running it. Um, so... With that said, uh, we are actually let an artist run this session. Uh, this is uh, something that we do after every panel. We realize that a lot of uh, these platforms now is for everybody to sit at home behind the screen. And so we really hope that uh, our artists also inspire you to get up and move a little bit or do some stuff. And for this day, uh, we have uh, really excited, to, I want to share um, Sonja Rademeyer um, to 
give our creative intervention for the end of this session. So Sonia, please take it away. There we go. Great, can you can all hear me? Um, I'm re I hope the audience is ready for uh, a disruptive um, uh, session. Um, uh, what I'm going to ask each one of you to do is uh, go to your profile pic at the top. You'll see there are three little, uh, there's a blue square, three little dots, and then just scroll down to pin video and uh, hit pin video, and then you should be able to see your own profile on screen. So if you can all do that quickly. Fantastic. Okay, everybody got the image on screen. Um, so I am going to ask uh, each one of you to move. If you have a laptop, if you're working on a on a on a, a, a tablet or even a phone, if you can take that device and move into the most d disruptive space in your house, the the loudest, the noisiest, the kids around you, the dogs. Uh, if that's outside or inside. If you can't, it's absolutely fine. Then you'll be staying um, where you are. Just open the windows, open the doors. Um, so let it not be that kind of quiet space where we've all been sitting. Okay. Um, so if you can move around while you go to select your space before you go, um, depending where you are, if you choose the, the, the kitchen, uh, try and use paper toweling. If you're going to be using, uh, if you're going to be sitting in the lounge, uh, use a, a, a magazine um, paper. If you're in the toilet, use toilet paper, but you need a piece of paper. You're going to need a pen, like a marker pen would be perfect, but an ordinary pen is also fine. I see some people moving around already. Fantastic. And then um, just something to, to peg. Um, just to peg. Yes, you could just use your um, uh, this little whatever can hold the paper to the actual screen. Okay. Um, and your cellular device. So I'm seeing a whole lot of people moving around already. Um, hopefully we can show that on screen. Just perfect. Perfect. Lots of movement happening around there. And um, we're gonna just do an intervention like a mish with a piece of paper. <laughs> Change the world. <laughs> okay, I I'm gonna ask you to fold the paper this way around, lengthwise and not that way around, it's just for your screen, it's easier. Okay, and what you can do is um, we're going to work with two sides. I have a very asymmetrical face, so it's very easy for me. Um, but we're going to work with a two, two sides of your face. Um, I'm going to hold it here, but you can actually put the paper on the screen, on your, on your screen face. Um, and just draw. We're going to pretend that's the delegate side of us. And what is the delegate side of us, you know, as professional people? Who are we? What, we don't have to, you don't have to draw. You can just make marks. I'm a mark maker. And who is that professional person? You know, what kind of face is that professional person? Um, it can be any, any mark. Okay. Um, I think I'll have a kind of a big ear for this. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing. Mark, make that professional person, the delegate here at PACE. Okay, I'm seeing wonderful drawings coming to life here. Great. Perfect. Okay, now, how are we doing? Everybody done? Now we're actually going to do the other side. Okay, and this is the the side that um, that we're not showing that 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 hidden side. Maybe you're feeling frustrated because you you actually have to do this intervention, or maybe you are feeling sad because you're at home and you, we would have wanted to be together in one space. Okay, and what is that? Uh, who is that? And what is that? Okay, so I've, I could maybe be feeling quite sad. 
that um, you know I'm not I'm not with all of you although we are together I'm not where I really want to be good Right, and now if you open it up, we have we have two faces, obviously, uh, or two sides to us. Uh, and what I'm going to ask you to do is the 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 disruptive face. Okay, so not the not the delegate face. And what I'm going to ask you to do is either take a screenshot of this, holding the paper in front of your face, or you can actually take your cellular device and take a a, a picture, an image of that a screenshot and send that to the WhatsApp group. And what will happen uh, once we receive it on the WhatsApp group is that we are going to be um, collating them and creating a, a black and white filter that we'll put over it. And these will become our new profile pics for PACE delegates. Okay, so it's gonna be very disruptive and um, disobedient. Um, but that's also the other side of who we are. Um, and to take it a step further than that, we are actually to, to disrupt the image a little bit further. My wonderful co-collaborator uh, at PACE and on multiple projects, Franco Prinsloo, is going to create a, a, a sound escape from these drawings. Um, and he will be um, posting uh, on the chat, he'll, he's going to be posting a bullet list, just some, some small steps, which you can actually do. You send this in to a certain website and it will create a sound. And then he will create a sound piece of this. So um, a lot of um, changes to and of identity and who we really are, or the multiple people we could actually be and um, hidden under the ordinary and the professional look. Um, I'd love for everybody just to hold up. If I can just see some of your drawings. Oh, fantastic. That's incredible. Great, well, some, seeing some beautiful colorful, from, oh, Erica, <laughs> there's your drawing. I see it, lovely. Fantastic. Okay, um, Franku, can you actually type in the, have we got it here already? Oh, he, oh you'll be putting it in on WhatsApp. Uh, okay. Um, how, are you, have you, how have you actually found this to be? You can unmute yourself and um, it'll be interesting to hear what your viewpoint is. Sonia, so hey. I've, posted on the chat for everyone uh, a few bullets so if you go to the website which is linked over there um, you can enter your name in in the description and use it as i've written there then you can choose a few tempos and what you're supposed to do is you take the image that sonia has now created with us um, and then you hold this image over a grid and what you will do on this website uh, over your screen, you'll hold the image and then you will, by clicking, recreate your image on this grid with little dots. And then in an instant, you will be able to listen to the sound of your drawing. Now, this okay. sounds, you can copy the link and also put it on the on the WhatsApp group. Um, and I will collect all of those sounds and create a, a pastiche collective collaborative sound sound piece with it which i will post later today so i encourage you all to follow these steps that i've posted to further enrich sonia's uh, lovely drawing intervention fantastic great thanks Franku. thanks very much for that and we look forward to hearing that and um seeing your profile pics on whatsapp and we'll be sending it back to you from the whatsapp group and if you can post them up as your profile pics um, as, a, as the disruption uh, of, of, of us on the African continent. Thank you. Thanks very much.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sonia and Franco. Uh, really a great way to get us all engaged and uh, to create art right now as we are sitting in our homes and, uh, and this way also get connected all together with each other. Really lovely. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing all of the photos uh, in our WhatsApp group. So please send them to the WhatsApp group. Um, before we end this session, just a few last housekeeping notes. Um, let me just get my uh, paper here together uh, so that we are all on the same page. Um, uh, a few things to mention. Uh, please check out, uh, if you haven't already, before our next session, go to the website, log into the website and check out the work in progress videos or works that are there. Um, Due to the fact that we have so many artists in these sessions, we can't, uh, in the actual live Zoom session, show all the work because it would take forever. So that's why we decided to upload this work already beforehand on the site. So people have always a chance and it will stay there. So even if you miss it now, you can look at it afterwards. You can look at all the works that are on the site. But I encourage you to have a look right now uh, in our little break. Uh, before the next session for work in progress, because that's where you will meet our eight work in progress artists uh, that will talk about their work uh, that they've put on the website. Um, don't forget to meet us in the lounge each day. Uh, it is fastly becoming our uh, popular favorite hangout place, I feel. Uh, yesterday, uh, we also tried our speed dating tool there that was very successful, um, uh, which uh, partners you or matches you with one person and then for three minutes you get to talk to them and then it throws you back in the orbit and it matches you with another person. It's just a little icebreaker to meet people that you otherwise would maybe never meet. Uh, and have a short conversation with them. But uh, in the lounge also, you have tables where you can sit at a table virtually and see the people that are at that table and you can have a conversation there. So definitely check that out. It's not on Zoom, it's on AirMeet. Uh, on Friday night, we will have our coffee clutch there. The coffee clutch basically means that each table will have a topic. Uh, and you can join the table of that topic. So people that are interested in a specific topic, we have 10 tables available. Uh, we already have several topics at the table. There's a leadership topic. There's a theater for young audiences topic. Um, so there are already some topics, but if people really feel like, hey, I would want to host a table around this topic, please uh, let Mark know. Uh, our uh, PACE uh, project manager know, uh, he's been in touch with the emails all the time, every day you get an email from him. Um, so please let him know because then we can add that topic on the table. It does mean that you have to show up on Friday at the lounge because you would be hosting that table. Um, on Saturday, the final lounge is where you get to meet our tour ready artists. Uh, each artist will be at a table. So if you, by that time, hopefully you've seen all the tour ready works that are also uploaded on the uh, website, and then you can join the table of the artists that you really, really are dying to meet or are, want to talk to. So that's on Saturday. Also, we have spotlights. Spotlights are projects that are happening alongside PACE. These are partner projects, people that we've partnered with. They are not part of the official PACE program, but they happen to have events going on right now as well. So for example, tonight, there's a Zoom session, uh, tonight meaning tonight South uh, Africa time. Uh, there's a Zoom session uh, of a really interesting collaboration uh, in the UK uh, about a project that is about uh, uh, the African continent. Um, I'm just quickly going down the list. We get a lot of questions from people about how to connect to others. Can we connect with each other like email addresses, stuff like that. We will make sure that after PACE is done, uh, give us a few weeks, it might be a week or two, uh, that we will all send you uh, a list with all the delegates that registered for uh, PACE. So you will get all the contact details. But right now, you could already go again to the website and there is a tab that says you have to log in though because it's only available for registered artists or registered delegates. Uh, there is a tab that says connect to other delegates. And that's where everybody is 
that is registered is there. So you can connect to people there. You can see their email address. You can, uh, if they have submitted their email address, but you can see basically uh, who they are. So again, on the website, there's a lot of information. Tomorrow, we also have workshops. I'm already gonna mention that right now. I'll mention it again in the lounge tonight as well, um, or, or later to, as well. Tomorrow, our afternoon session has workshops please check on the website what workshops are offered because some of these workshops are happening at the same time. So you have different Zoom links for different workshops and then you can choose to join a workshop uh, tomorrow. They are bound to be very exciting and very active, which uh, I think is great uh, after us all sitting a lot also. Um, then last but not least, uh, our next session is up in exactly half an hour. In 30 minutes, we will meet back, but not on Zoom. We will meet back on AirMeet. Our afternoon session is on AirMeet this afternoon. You should have all received the links, uh, first of all, for the whole week, but also each day, uh, our administration is sending out the links for each day. Uh, this afternoon, our AirMeet session will be facilitated by Fumi Adewele. And our speakers uh, will be the work in progress artists, as well as our producers lab people. Uh, check out the work on the side, like I said. Uh, just a quick internal note. Uh, the speakers, the artists that are speaking this afternoon and the producers lab people, please use your private speaker link to go into AirMeet. Everybody else, all of us can use the general link but anybody that has to be on stage speaking, you've been sent a private, uh, uh, specifically for you speaker link. So this is only to the artists that are the work in progress artists today and uh, the producers lab people. Um, so please use that link, not the general link because then you won't be able to get on stage. That's it for me. Uh, thank you so much to our panel. Thank you, Sonia, for a fantastic creative intervention. Uh, really exciting work, everybody. Thank you all for being with us. And we really look forward to see you all the, back this afternoon for our work in progress presentations. Stretch your legs. Get and we are back live after some technical difficulties. So whoever is joining us on Facebook, uh, hello back. It's a little later than uh, we uh, planned. Unfortunately, we ran into some technical difficulties, which of course can always happen in these online platforms. But uh, welcome back. Uh, we will run the session a little bit longer. Uh, so our AirMeet lounge later on might start a little later, uh, but uh, I would like now to give the word uh, and welcome Fumi Adewele, who will facilitate our work in progress session. Fumi, take it away. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming back after, you know, that little struggle with air meat. Um, but um, the afternoon continues. We have um, eight exciting artists booked for this work in progress session. Um, we're going to keep this, the, the, the talks very short and um, the artists will speak for a few minutes, about five minutes, and then I will ask a question or two. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. If you have comments, please put them in the chat and I'll read out as much as I can. If I can't read them out, the chat's going to be made available so people will be able to share. But the aim of this session really is for you to, to know the artist, get an idea about the work, go online. The videos are on the website under the work in progress link. So please go there, engage with the work, reach out to the artists. The artists might read out, reach out to you, put comments in the chat, hang in the lounge. Please speak to them. This is all about networking, collaboration, and finding out what new is happening in Africa. So Sherry Strang was supposed to be the first person today, and she's unable to log on. Um, she has another appointment. She had a clash. But please go on, on the website and see her work. It's called... I had enough, so I killed him. And um, it's a dance piece. I watched it, it's beautiful dance. And she uses the iconic poem by um, Maya Angelou, which is, and still I rise, as well as 
taking um taking using visuals from her own grandmother so it's a personal story as well so please engage with her work she's she sent a message saying she would like you to reach out and and connect with her so that's sherry strang i had enough so i killed him so the the first person we're going to uh, the next that is live with us on air is um, the gentleman what, the gentleman here, Charles Ntembi. Am I pronouncing your name correct? No. Okay. Sorry, Charles. His piece is called 54 Silhouettes. So I'll just pass it over to him so he can introduce himself properly and tell us about the piece. Charles. Unmute. Unmute. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Charles Etubiebi. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm Charles Etubiebi. Um, I'm an actor, TV stage film actor, and also the artistic director for Theatre Industry International. Um, our, our, our play, 54 Silhouettes, um, lucky for us, lucky for all of us, we have the writer director in the room as well. So after I speak this, I'm going to also pass it over to him, who is Africa Oko. He's the writer-director of the play. Um, 54 Silhouettes originally was a five-man piece, but um, in 20, uh, it was a five-man piece, which I played one of the characters. And in 2018, an opportunity came for us to um, travel to um, uh, Rio, Rio de Janeiro in, in, in Brazil for the NIP Festival. And um, I was supposed to present a paper on the Black Dramaturgs, and I spoke to Africa about uh, working on the piece because it was it was it was a theme. The, the festival was themed um, reclaiming our heritage, something along those lines. And I felt the piece was a wonderful piece to speak to that theme. So I spoke to Africa and I said, you know what? Let's see if we can write this into a one man piece. Um, side note: at the point, I think I was going through a uh, midlife crisis. <laughs> I thought to myself that a uh, one-man piece would be something to kickstart that or give that shock therapy, which I spoke to Africa about, and wonderfully, wonderfully, so he wrote the piece. He wrote, he wrote the play into a one-man piece, and we rehearsed for I think three months or so, and performed it there. We performed so we've we've so far the piece has been performed in Brazil. It's been performed in um, Lagos at the Lagos Theatre Festival, and quite recently last year at the uh, United Solace International Theatre Festival last year in New York, um, off Broadway at the Theatre Row. Um, for us, what's most important is the reintroduction of the world to what it means to be African. That's, what, well, that's, that's one of the strong themes in the play. Um, it's, it's, it's one thing to, to speak about a person, but it's another thing to understand who the person is and speak to them in a way that is respectable. Your, your, your opinions of people can sometimes, even though we don't realize it, it's a bit prejudiced. It might be a bit tainted, and in, it might be tainted in ways where, 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 we can, where, where one can feel it's insensitive to a person's nature, to a person's heritage, to a person's culture and, 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 and cultural background. And firstly, also, it speaks to that. It speaks to the fact that we are more than, we are more than just what you see on TV. Uh -huh. We are more than just the narrative that everybody else has seen on the internet. We are complete. Don't just give one side of the narrative and think that the other side of it is, is unimportant. I mean, there, 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 were, there were some funny lines that were, well, well I, 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 I wouldn't say funny, but there were, there were some really, really strong lines that were in, in the performance, in, in the writing. Things about... Just... Uh, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to wrap yes. up and I'm going to hand <laughs> over. You know what? I'm going to hand over to Africa at this point. I think I'm the actor, so I'm going to hand over to Africa at this point. Just drop one or two things of what we're looking for today and why he was the first thing. Sorry. Okay, Africa? no, good. I forgot to tell everybody that because we're so pushed for time, I'm going to intervene with a countdown. So I will start going 10. Nine, eight, <laughs> and then all of you will start wrapping up. So that's what I'm going to yes. do when it gets time is going. 
I enjoyed that anyway. So Africa, thanks Charles. Africa, thank you. Hello everyone. Africa Uko is the writer and director of the piece. And um, you met Charles, he's an amazing actor. Please go onto the website and watch him in the working progress section. The piece is called 54 Silhouettes. And what um, Africa grabbed me about that piece was to watch one actor playing so many roles. And I also found that um, the, the theme which um, Charles spoke about, um, about the respect for the African hu human personality, um, is treated in a very, very funny way in that um, he's playing a character who is an actor who has promised himself that he will never play, he will never act in a film which is about Africa at war. And then he's cast in such a film and the stereotypes, you know, just pile up. So um, Africa, how did you come to this idea? And to treat it in this way? It came from my own and a, a sudden awareness of my own pent up frustrations with the way Africa, the African continent, the African people are presented on media, especially global media. Um, for me, I thought it's, it's always been a thing of, it's not a thing of blame, it's not a thing of pointing and saying, oh, so and so people are doing this and it's bad and they should also do good. I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in. The complexity of the people, the good and bad, but also the shades of grey, which is where I believe we mostly live in those shades of grey as we try to improve as people. So it was in trying to tackle that and in trying to create this work that spoke to that and says, look, there's a complexity here that's being lost. There's something here that we are not that is not that we are not saying and is not being said. Because it's, those are the two ways. It's one thing to turn to, say, Hollywood and say, oh, this is how you present people. But then Nigerians themselves or South Africans themselves or Malawians themselves or whoever also have to look at their own selves and say, well, what are we doing about our own image out there in the global sphere? That, that was one aspect of it. Um, another was just the, the idea of the theme of cultural understanding is something that's always fascinated me as a person. I grew up in multicultural environments. Uh, my voice interacted with people outside of my, my own ethnic group, my own worldview. I've always had that very kind of dynamic mix of human relationships and the complexities that come with that were very fascinating to me. Back then, yeah. it was a clear routine about 10 years ago. And I think over time, it's even become more interesting than was back then, particularly because of how global entertainment is growing with streaming going global and everyone looking mm. to places all over the world. Okay, what can we do with stories from India? What can we do with stories from the African continent? What can we do with stories from uh, Asia or wherever? As we do that, we're mixing more as a people. And with that comes the complexities of power dynamics. What happens okay. when someone, what happens when someone from Germany is in charge of a story about Pakistanis? How do you what's going on there? What are, what are the complexities that come with that? How do you mm -hmm. balance that? How do we interact such that those power dynamics do not become corrosive? Because they'll always be there. You can't get rid of them. But how do we find that balance? Okay. So Africa, what would you what would you want now to in order to continue? What would you what what would you need for the work to continue in terms of are you looking for more touring? Are you looking for collaborators? So in a few sentences, can you tell us what you'd like? Oh, well, we are looking for touring. Certainly, like Charles said, it has this one man phone, but it also has this five man phone. So that presents very different opportunities for each. Mm -hmm. We of course like, like the idea of an entire package where can do both whether it's at separate times or as one package, um, as a one-man play, whether it's domestic touring, international touring, they are, we're very open to that, we are looking to that. We very much like the idea because at the thematic level, it deals with diversity, it deals with cultural mix. We very much like the idea of also translating that into the project as well. 
So when, in, when you have an international cast as well, it has two Americans, two Nigerians, one British Nigerian. So mm -hmm. we've always had, we long had this idea of what if you don't, you don't just have only Nigerians playing, but what if you have a cast that also represents that diversity? And then you have two American actors, two Nigerian actors, and a British yeah. actor, a British Nigerian. And so the diversity of the theme is also being reflected in the international cast. And that mix of different worldviews, different performance styles, different artistic mm -hmm. sensibilities being balanced together. Then, of course, the one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ayo Deji in the chat says, it's a great story. I've watched it twice in Lagos. The actor's phenomenal. A good one, Charles. So please um, get in touch with um, the team. Um, Ricardo Peach has put the artist details in the chat and you can find the work online. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Africa. And so we're going to um, our next artist, who is a musician. Misery, mis, misery? can you? Marisi, Marisi. Marisi. Yeah, I'm, for, I'm for not going to say African. anybody's name anymore. No, it's, it's cool. That's like the English pronunciation for the South Africans <laughs> on the chat. It's Marisi. Marisi. Marisi, yeah, yeah. So thank you. Your piece is um, a hip hop jazz experience. That's how it's described. Yeah. And um, it's you and your band yeah. um, playing, and you're on the piano, and you do a, your you're performing in, in a British rap style. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and just yeah. before we came on, I asked Marissi what, um, how would he describe British rap? And um, he gave me a long talk, so I'm not asking him to repeat. I'm just going to hand, a ho hand over to him and please introduce your work and tell us, and tell us a bit more about it. Um, so my work, I'd say that, so basically I'm a, I'm a pianist for, first and foremost and a rapper. Um, singer as well. Don't like the don't like to use the word rapper too much, but that's yeah. I'm a rapper, singer, poet, wordsmith, and and pianist and musician. Um, and what so how I perform is I perform playing keys and I rap um, kind of at the same time. Um, and I've got uh, how many like eight piece band. So two backing vocalists, bass, drums, guitar. Um, and yeah, that's that's it's a bass, drums, guitar. Yeah, and that's that's ah, and saxophone. And my music is more leaning, I'd say, polit more towards the political side. It's very lyrical, um, but it's also very um, jazzy in a in a genre sense. I'm also kind of trying to move more towards the the, the Afro sound, if you will, Afro swing. Um, you know, traditional South African music, I'm putting influences in there, which is one of what you heard in Venda. Um, mm -hmm. That keys line that I'm playing there is very, um, I try to emulate the marimbas a lot. So that crank, 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 crank. And then um, obviously with the with the Revolution song, that was the dum ka ka dum dum ka da ka da. But also trying to keep it very jazzy um, mm -hmm. at the same time. And, and you know, trying to, trying to have a message as well, but also obviously, it's very influenced in that kind of English rapping style um, because that's kind of, I'd say musically where my, where my love for music was, was through rap music. But then, as you know, for me, my, my dad is, is a, is a mm -hmm. South African musician, traditional musician, percussionist. And then my mum is a poet. So then kind of merging, merging those things but yeah for me it's i'd say i'd really kind of categorize my music as as afro jazz that's what i've been trying to yeah. play with that idea you know? um, i um my experience of um listening to it and watching i mean it's it's a lot you're lovely to watch and your band is lovely to watch because they're so into the music and your singers yeah, um yeah, yeah. and i so said I'm to you it felt like, yeah it felt yeah. like going on a tour because i could um you know, I could hear influences of reggae. I could hear, you know, the African music, and then the the vocals, which you know, it's definitely rap. You speak very fast. You cover global. It was like global politics, racial politics. What it meant to be a black man in Britain today. So, 
you know, uh, yeah, a wordsmith and you're, you know, you're rapping, we can listen to, and we can hear that, we can listen to it as you, you play and you sing. So it's quite an immersive um, experience. Um, yeah. It's not a concert where you just tune out. It's not the kind of jazz that you just tune out. You have to really engage with the lyrics. Yeah, yeah. So I would like to say, uh, what would you like to say? What would you need now? What would you like to say to the people listening today? It's, yeah, it's funny you, you kind of say about uh, what I'm trying to do basically with my music is, is I'm trying to make people dance, um, but also listen at the same time. So I want to try and find a balance so that people can, can move as well as take in. But what I need um, is <clears throat> touring, basically. Um, I need touring, but also the space to be able to grow on, on the band because the band how it is is very you know there's a few key musicians in there and you know as a group i've kind of got the core there you know everyone's there um but it needs to be built upon but it also needs touring and i'd say for now the main thing is touring um i really want to do uh international work um especially in africa uh, mm -hmm. very specifically south africa because i really want to um yeah, just tap into to the South African scene. I've been trying to make inroads, you know, I've got yeah. people, I've, you know, I've, obviously I've met people through, 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 through Pace and um, the, 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 the Free State Festival. And I've also, um, you know, that's through, through Jenny and Nexus, but I've also made kind of musical connections through family and friends in South Africa and family friends in South Africa as well. So that, that has helped but my main thing is yeah just touring taking the show you know across Europe um yeah across South Africa Southern Africa the whole of Africa you know I'd love to hit up Nigeria at some point that's yes. like um because I <laughs> even just I've I've heard that it's really yeah. like even the scene out there and stuff um, yeah it's really strong it's so really thank strong. you very much yeah. um please connect with Marissi Again, nice please say your name yourself because Marissi, Marissi, how you how you pronounced it there is cool. But as I said for the South Africans on the chat, it's Marissi. But Marissi. Yeah, even me, I don't I don't pronounce my name like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's Marissi. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So nice next, uh, the next piece we're going to be talking about is called Simon, and the artist is a dancer choreographer. His name is Tammy. He will introduce himself in full and he's made a beautiful evocative solo piece about a South African icon called Simon. So Tammy, can you take or can you yes, switch on your camera? Yes, it's on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Oh, pleased to meet you. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us briefly about your piece? Great. Hi everyone, I am Tamisha Balala. I am a creative director, producer, choreographer, and a dancer. So I created Simon two years, a year ago, actually, but I actually started conceptualizing the work in 2018 because I was looking for something that would like stimulate my mind and like will absolutely like evoke my creative muscle. And I was like, okay, cool, let's go about creating a work. And I'm really interested in telling people's stories. So I read a lot of like African stories, a lot of African biographies, and I went past this amazing story about Simon Zikongoli that connected with me because of his sexuality and the, the, the race that he ran as well. So the work really details um, um, and pays homage to the African legend Simon Zikongoli, who was an anti-apartheid Black gay movement founder and HIV activist. So the work details his journey, his struggles, triumphs, social acceptance, and pure expression of himself to the brim of, of his, ex, of his ex, um, ex existence. You know, so um, the work aims to celebrate and educate the, the nation and many more of unsung heroes of the, that we have in, in, in Africa a lot, because my biggest passion is to, is to always recreate and create the African Renaissance. The African narrative is very important for us because at the end of the day, then we have people telling stories on our behalf when we have the ability and the complete background and the full resources to be able to, to do that. So I staged the work firstly at the Dance Umbrella Africa under the curatorship of my Mala Nyamza in April, 2019. And then because of the of success and popular 
popular demand, they'd ask for someone to come back for a, a full season at so, so so I Can Say Theatre, which I did for five shows there, the theatre. And then to my surprise, I got nominated for the Swim the Levy Awards, which is a really huge um, theatre award ceremony in South Africa. And it was the first category of its first kind based contemporary production of 2019. And I was one of the younger artists to be nominated for it. And I was like, wow, you see, so there are platforms, I have a voice. So if you have a voice, literally, like you can change everything because for, speaking for the marginalized and the young artists for me in my country that are always sidelined because we are always told you, you're not good enough or there's not enough resources. I'm like, you know what? I'll use my own money. I am not going to wait for anybody to actually help me. I'll use my own money so I can, we can tell these stories and create this archive for, of history so that people next, next time in the generation are looking up to create contemporary works and dance productions of the generations but prior to them. They will look up works of our kind, the Gregory McCormas, Daniel Masillo, you know, because at the end of the day, I really believe being an artist is about telling and telling stories. And also, as Nina Simone says, I live on this mantra. My best quote ever is the, art, the artist's responsibility and duty is to tell the stories of what's happening at the moment and okay. to start conversations yeah. that yeah. will adhere to better. So there's some comments in the chat. Ricardo Peach says, I just love, love these narratives around Simon Nkuli, such an important queer African man. And Mar um, Maria Weathers, she says, congratulations, Tammy. Thank um, you. I watched the piece and um, what struck me is I was expecting maybe a protest piece, you know, a piece sure. with a lot of anger. But um, you, um, can, you, you, you pitched it at a very sort of meditative level very personal it was very subtle it was very emotional and there's one scene that really got me is when he was speaking to his mother's dress and obviously his, his mother's voice was 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 um over you know recorded and then he put yes. on her dress and started to dance and i thought that was a, a very beautiful moment um you yeah. were explaining to me why you decided to um approach the issue like that could you say a bit a bit more about that why did sure, you absolutely yeah um because um simon's story is not so far-fetched from my story just because he lived generations or years before me doesn't mean his story and his struggle is completely far from me this his struggle was never over until actually was never over so i just took the baton from him and i ran with it and also when i created simon i wanted to make it very personal to myself as well and internalize all the emotions and the journey that he went through because i had went through the same thing as well so when i decided to especially create that mother scene when i came out to my parents that i was homosexual it was a very 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 tough um, situation because in the african culture as my dad's only son it was impossible for me to, to be homosexual how, how are we going to carry on the generational legacy how are you going to have kids and have grandkids and i said to him don't worry about that. That has got nothing to worry about because at the end of the day, I'm still human and creating, creating that scene for me was a conversation that I've always wanted to have and I've always yearned to have with my mom. And the only way I could do it because I'm a man of minimal words was to put it on stage and create that scene and interact with the dress. And also I, learned, I asked my mom for that dress, but um, with surprising enough. So when I got the dress from her and when I, I actually decided to do that scene, I was like, oh wow, it actually really works. And I internalized this whole work because the story is super personal. And as an artist, you, you only create as personal as the art is to yourself and people only resonate with the art as long as it's personal more to yourself. So I decided to go with a, a more trajectory work, like the, giving the audience a full experience, taking them up and down with wow. Simon's emotion, his journey, when he was in the jail cell, when he was protesting against um, the anti-apartheid regime, when he was protesting against the black gay movement, when he actually was the one who adversed for the LGBTI community with the ANC government that, hey, the rights need to be uplifted. We, have, we, we are one. We are not segregated because of sexuality, but we are one as we are in Africa. So. Yeah. Okay. So Tammy, what 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 do you want? What do you want for the work to continue? So, well, to be honest, I really would like this work to tour a lot because I want to really shine light on the African narrative. 
I want um, to preserve and nourish and export the African narrative by the African child so that it is not subdued, it is not um, watered down or watermarked because it's told by somebody else, but it's told by the African child for the African people, for the world, because our group, we've got a lot of like encrypted and like really beautiful archive stories in our um, generation and in our archive as, as Africans that have never seen the, the light of day. So by doing that, I would really like to also have a platform to engage and deliberate with like-minded artists who will continue to share knowledge and guidance and open up more platforms for me to perform this work internationally and South and main, mainly in Africa because still it's still a taboo in Africa in a lot of countries. So mm -hmm. the more we start these conversations, have these platforms to create these works and to display them to the to the masses, the easiest okay. thing for the next child to grow up. So thank you very much. Oh. Thank you. So please connect with Tammy um, in the social lounge and during the festival. So our next artist now is a choreographer who I call Cizé. And she's going to tell us about her dance piece. Cizé, can you put your camera on? Cizé? Is Caesar here? Um, hi. Sorry about Hi, sorry. Uh, yeah. my name is Caesar. Yes. Sorry about that. I had another urgent call to take. Um, hi, my name is Zagil D, and uh, I'm a female choreographer from Bloemfontein and I choreographed Ndibolege in Gubo and this, this work is about femicide and uh, the intention of the work is to look at the psychology of men that kill and uh, the events that happen that, that, that the work is filled with are from actual events that took place. The environment of the work happens um, in a prison cell and uh, this guy is about to die and just before he's about to die his forefather who has already passed on sees his death his brutal death that is about to come and his forefather over one day wants him to actually atone and show some sort of remorse for the women and the number of women that he has killed and how he has killed them but uh, this man actually refuses to atone and in the african proverb there's what we call isitunzi sendoda and I took that and I uh, broke it up into two. And there are two dancers that physicalize uh, is Tunzizake. The one shadow plays uh, the mind and the other shadow plays the soul. And uh, the forefather asks him a lot of questions. He questions him on um, what brings him to the decision to kill. Is it the mind or the soul? And um, he takes him through various stages of wanting to atone. And as he does, as he refuses to atone, he keeps raising the stakes and he shows him little children and what, what could have been with their future if he had not killed them. And he brings in his mother and what if his mother was killed in that sense. But the man refuses to atone. And uh, at the end, when he sees how he's about to die, that's when he wants to atone, but it's a little too much um, too late. And the work was inspired by my fear as a South African woman um, I created this work in 2018 and femicide was there, but it was not as a terrible pandemic as it is today in South Africa, where it is uh, terrifying to live in South Africa today as a woman. And um, this is my way of just speaking out and fighting back through um, my artistic voice and my creation. Yeah, thank you. Sonia in the chat is agreeing with you. She says your work is very powerful and necessary and very relative. Um, Charles is saying thank you to Tammy. So that's another um, misreading the quote. So that was for to Tammy. But um, Sonia is saying thank you to you for this necessary work. Um, you've performed this work in a number of places already. What has the response been? Um, I brought the work to the Pace Lab last year because the work was very abstract. And uh, you were one of the facilitators and uh, Mike van Alphen that had a look at the work and suggested um, other ways because the work was very technical to actually try and make it more abstract and abstract and make it more readable. So this year, 
we had received uh, funding from the lottery to do it in schools because we thought um, this is a conversation that we need to have with uh, with the younger with the younger generation because um, you find that especially in the townships uh, these boys when you see them after school they're busy twisting the little girls' arms and they're slapping them around and. So we thought, let's just have this conversation in high school. So we had a Bloemfontein and a Free State um, Femicide Awareness High School tour. And um, just before COVID hit, we had actually done three schools where we made the work more literal so that the kids can quickly read it and understand it and interpret it much faster. And it had a wonderful response. And we were looking forward to working it all out in such a way that it can become a a one hour work that we would have a festival in each school that we had gone to because the principals mm -hmm. had agreed and we're just doing 15 minutes in every school. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, because of COVID, we just had to stop. But the three schools that we went to, we had an amazing response and the kids got it. And you'd be surprised the number of girls that actually say, yes, I've been slapped by a boy at school. And the number of boys that actually say, no, I didn't think it was a big deal for me to dismiss her when she speaks or to slap her. But it's, it's, it's something that we really, it's a conversation that really needs to be, ha to be mm -hmm. had. Charles Henning is saying in the chat, aiding the youth to rediscover mature masculine energies. Great. So, um, Sise, what do you need for the work to continue? What would you like to go forward from here? How would you like to go forward? Um, I already know um, how I want to finish off the work because um, just before COVID, we were already working on it. Um, I would like more platforms, um, especially up Africa. And um, I would like to have more you know, stages to be able to showcase the work. Um, the 15 minutes that we have done for the schools is so powerful. I feel like even just that 15 minutes, if I can move, um, to different schools around the whole of South Africa and up Africa as well, uh, performing it and talking to the youth. I find it more motivating to speak to the younger audience than the older audience. Right. So if, you, if you're if you someone who can facilitate that for Cizé, please get in touch with her. As we say, the artist details are in the chat and Cizé will be around for the rest of the week. Please. So thank you very much. So we're now going to our next piece, and it's called Nightlight, another dance piece. You've got a lot of uh, very talented dancer, choreographer, um, performers um, in the work in pro progress today, and it's Danielle Rodin. Hi, hi. Hi, Danielle. And Danielle's piece, Nightlight, is about a young girl. Can you tell us more? Absolutely. Um, so Nightlight is essentially about um, a, a night in one girl's life um, uh, where she's feeling very scared and uh, she's struggling in the dark, but also struggling with sleep. So there's a, there's a bit of a nightmare haunting her. Um, the, the piece was designed with the intention of being able to uh, go into, uh, oh, sorry, it's also for young audiences. Um, it's aimed at nine to 11 year olds. Um, and uh, the piece was designed and created with the intention to really uh, travel to spaces that are, are not necessarily only theater spaces and are not only in urban areas. So we really designed it with the idea that we'd be able to take everything with us, but still have a bit of the magic of theater. So our little, we've got a little, um, now it's a gazebo um, where we attach all of our lights and we travel with our sound as well. Um, unfortunately, in this moment, uh, it's a bit of a tricky one because our audience would be quite closely packed together. So, so we, we're starting to think about, you know, where to from here, um, but, but that's essentially the piece. Oh, um, I, I watched the piece online and I was enthralled. It was quite magical and quite dimly lit. And you did really feel you in a bedroom, uh, you know, and in, a, and in a magical space. And you, um, what I read is that you made this piece to encourage children to listen to their inner voice. And there was a line in the piece that really resonated with me which goes, listen to the rush of your blood as it flows. <laughs> um, why did you decide that this was a, a topic that you wanted to treat? 
Well, actually, um, I've been I've been j slowly moving towards creating work for younger audiences um, over the last few years. And a, a few years ago, I did a, a workshop with Azitej South Africa about creating work for this age group. And during that time, we were encouraged to kind of look back at our own lives and kind of explore a little something. And in that moment, in, in, my, in my adult life, I was feeling so desperate for, for to be in like a small, dark town. I just like needed this darkness. And I, I had this like this interesting, you know, pull towards it. Um, and then when I was in that workshop, I started to realize that around this age group, I had a very complex relationship with the dark, um, where I had some beautiful moments in the dark looking at the stars, but I also remember being quite scared in certain moments by myself in my room or, or whatever. And so really it was just about exploring that and, and not shying away from difficult topics for young audiences, because really I think the truth is, is that we have to engage with the more difficult topics in a magical way, um, yes. you know, in order to kind of, yeah, just normalize it and and allow allow that recognition to be there. It's a beautiful piece for nine to 11 year olds. So how would you want to continue? How would you like to take this forward? Awesome. So we've been thinking about what next in this moment and we would really, across all of this, funding would be amazing, partners, potential collaborators as well. Um, what we feel the next step is, is to film it so that we have a filmed version of the show um, that can go into even virtual festivals now. But beyond that, we really wanna take this moment to create an interactive uh, performance offering. Um, we'd really like to create something where um, our audiences, our audience, our young audiences perhaps engage with it in smaller segments and um, are able to reflect on the experience as part of the performance, as part of the experience uh, using digital platforms like this one. I've also been looking, looking into some more uh, learning based platforms that might be able to support mm -hmm. uh, different kinds of um, offerings on, on, this, on the platform. So you could collaborate with a range of organizations from educational institutions, online platforms, to theaters. Um, so a number of organizations. I just want to read um, Charles Henning in the chat saying, amazing, introducing the notion of trusting one's inner voice, intuition exactly. from a young age, shaping of one's psychological presence. Fantastic. So thank you, da Daniela. Please Thanks mingle so and have chats with lots of people whilst you're at pace. Will do. Good. So we have two more artists um, this afternoon and the next artist is Shegon Adifila. And he's going to be telling us about his piece, which is called Oma Dumping. Hey everybody. Hi Shegon, hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, one minute, please. <laughs> All right, yes. Um, I'm a dumping basically. Um, is, a, is one of the creations by Crown Talk of Africa. And what we're discussing is, um, is the issue of migration. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We're discussing the issue of um, migration, you know. Um, it's not a peculiar thing to Nigeria, but it's an African thing. And if you consider what's been going on, you know, before colonization, we thought that Africa was colonized through, through, through um, entrances, that is the, the sea, the ocean, and the, and the deserts. And it was difficult getting Africans out. I mean, these are narratives that we're all used to. But the surprising thing is that today, all the young people are the, the labor force um, is leaving because of their search for cleaner pastures. So we really carried out a research where we went to the villages where you call countryside in other places, we call them villages. And um, you find big houses that are empty. And the only people you find there are young people, very children and very old people. 
Now, this is where we have all the farms. This is where the food that we feed the, the entire nation should be coming from. But then you have only young people, children and, and um, elderly people, grandparents. The labor force are really in the urban area. They move to the cities. And when they get to the cities, they become so disillusioned and then they want to go abroad. So they do every kind of thing to get to, you know, uh, my migration destination countries like um, like Europe and America and so on. And when they get there, reality hits. So you see us running around and um, we thought that Oma Dumping would be a good intervention that really Can you the, the, a, a conversation, a dialogue between the host countries, you know, because migration is, is a natural thing. Human beings move from place to place. It's natural and animals do it too. But when it is um, when it is a forced one, when it is not out of um, when it is enforced, that, that becomes a problem, and it's a problem on the hosting country. So you have so many people. All of a sudden, people just storm your 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 place, and you don't know where they're coming from, and you feel yeah. overwhelmed sometimes. Your people have a right to have that kind of fear, and so it's it's just about a conversation between the migrants, the hosting national um, countries, and where they are coming from, and. You know, so it's just to share these these stories, these ideas of what would make me leave my country. If you understand me, maybe you want to treat me with a bit of understanding. And if I know your fears too, maybe I want to take care of your space as if it's mine, yeah. so we can all you know yeah. make this world what it's supposed to be. Thank you. Yes, yeah, Shagun. Um, very interesting. How how many how big is the cast for this piece? Um. There's six dancers and three musicians, and of course the um, choreographer and director. Okay, six dancers, three musicians, choreographer, director, and yes. I notice it's, you you describe it as a multimedia performance. Oh well, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is it uh, from what I saw, you have a screen behind on on the psychorama and the characters in the videos that you play are speaking in Yoruba, so it seems to be multilingual. You have different languages coming through. Yes, yes. yes. Um, it's a research-based work. You know, we mm -hmm. actually went to the villages and spoke with people, with elderly people, and a few young people we find around. We talk to them, why are you staying in the village? Why are you not in the city like everybody? And we spoke with people in the city too, and so we, we played this back while the performance was going on. Okay, thank you. So where do you want to go from here? Yes, um, it's, it, 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 dumping is supposed to is supposed to be an ongoing conversation because we stopped right now where they arrived at their destinations abroad. But then there's this space for another kind of conversation with the people they meet and how they interact and the kind of things that they get into, how you know sometimes those dreams just blow up in your face and you're like, wow, okay the reality is different from the imagination. Mm -hmm. you know, so we really want to explore that space and um, it would be nice to have um, people to collaborate with us on this. And we're also looking for theaters who are open to that kind of conversation. Let's hear from you know, these young people. Again, it's going to be a good opportunity for the young people I work with in Crown Crew to see other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you very much, Shagun. So please get in touch with Shagun and as he um, engages with Pace. So our last artist for today is another musician and he's created an album called A Tout Epeuve. It's in French and it translates as Full Proof and he's of Chadian origin. So can you please um, make yourself visible? A Tout Am I am I pronouncing it correctly? Is the artist in the room? Is the artist in the room? It seems like the artist might not be here. Okay. 
in that case, we've come to the end. Oh, it seems that he's lost his connection, unfortunately. So he's lost his connection, but please check him up in the working progress section on the website. And you'll see that the, the, the name of his piece is Atut Epov, and I'll put the title in the chat. And please um, listen to the music. It's an album which is in French and um, he and it's um, it's fused with um, Malian rhythm. So it's hip hop fused with different kinds of Malian rhythms. Sai, Dayan, and these are rhythms that he, he writes about. And his themes are put on politics and social topics. So thank you for being here for the for the work in progress session. Please, if you look in the chat, you'll see a number of links and um, PDFs if, and different people. Please talk to each other. And hopefully, um, we'll be able to do some more interaction later today. So right now, I'm going to hand you over to Erwin Mass. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Fumi, and, and all the artists. Uh, unfortunately, we, we missed two of them. Uh, internet uh, is remains sometimes a, a, a fickling thing, uh, and so sometimes people have trouble getting on. Um, but uh, despite all our earlier uh, technological challenges, uh, I thought this was a great session. Uh, thank you for moving it along, Fumi, and wonderful artists to hear your perspectives on the work. Uh, as mentioned, unfortunately, we cannot share the full work in these live sessions uh, because that just would take much too long. Uh, but anybody can go that registered, anybody can go on the website and engage with the artists there by going to uh, connect with other delegates and you can find the artists there and you can look at their work under the work in progress tab and you can find more information about their work there and also the videos. So uh, please engage and check out their work because a lot of these works are really, really worthwhile uh, uh, presenting, are really worthwhile uh, engaging with. Um, Thank you so much again. Just a few little housekeeping notes. I'm, I'm the housekeeper in that sense. Uh, so due to our uh, challenges earlier, we of course anticipated that this session would run a little bit longer, but unfortunately because we missed two, we actually are now pretty much on time. However, we have communicated uh, to all the delegates uh, also that are not here. We have communicated that our lounge today uh, we'll start just 10 to 15 minutes later uh, because we anticipated that this session would run uh, longer. Uh, so uh, if you try to get into the Airmeet lounge uh, at 4.45, it might just not be activated yet. So please be patient and just check back in at a little bit before five. Uh, this is South African standard time. Um, so uh, in about a, a little half hour from now, 20 minutes from now, uh, uh, 25 minutes uh, to a half hour, you can all log in to the Airmeet Lounge. And there, hopefully, the artists that just presented can join as well and be at tables so you can further discuss uh, these works uh, there. Um, compared to yesterday, for those that were with us yesterday in the lounge, Yesterday, of course, because it was our first day, we had our funders present and presented there. Um, that is not happening today. So actually today, the full hour, you basically have uh, the chance to engage with people at the tables and you can leave a table and join another table and meet people that way. We might try again the speed dating function, which means that we're all in the orbit and you're matched with one person for three minutes and that's another way to meet people. Uh, so that might happen as well. That's it for uh, today. Uh, again, please check out uh, the website, uh, connect with people there, check out the works there. Tomorrow we have workshops in the afternoon. Some workshops are running uh, consecutively or actually, I mean, at the same time. And so you have to uh, check which workshop you wanna do uh, because they have separate Zoom links. Tomorrow, all our sessions uh, in the earlier day, the first two sessions are on Zoom and the final session, the lounge, of course, every day will be on AirMeet. 
Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day, stretch, and hopefully we see you all uh, in the lounge. And if not, please join us back again tomorrow at 1 p.m. South African Standard Time for another great panel on touring your work. So a lot of artists have been saying, we want to tour this work. Well, <laughs> tomorrow in the panel, you'll meet festival directors and producers that actually uh, my book and uh, tour your work. So ask your questions there and also connect with them uh, in uh, the website. Thank you all uh, and see you in 